chapter, I hopefully for the last time, maybe not, but we've come to chapter 13 of Hebrews as we walked our way through this wonderful book that Paul wrote to those Hebrews that were scattered abroad during the persecution in the early days of the church. And, and some of them were going back, as it were, to Judaism, to religion, um, to escape the persecution that the Roman Empire was bringing on those Christians at that time. And so Paul writes this very encouraging message, as it were. You know, he walks us through Jesus superior to angels because, you know, again, the rabbis taught in Judaism that it was the angels that took the Ten Commandments out of the hand of God and delivered it to Moses. And so the angels mediated the law, but Jesus mediated grace. And then he says he's superior to Moses. Moses could get him out, but couldn't get him in. Remember, he got him out of the... Uh, out of the yeah, out of Egypt, but couldn't get him into the promised land, and then superior to Aaron and the Levitical priesthood, because Aaron and the Levitical priesthood could not remove your sin; it only covered it. Isn't it a wonderful thought to know this morning that if you are in Christ Jesus, if you come to Christ by faith, put your faith in Him, that your sins aren't just covered; they're removed, and that's what He's talking about when we got to chapter ten. When he said in chapter 10, by one sacrifice, the sacrifice of Christ, that you have been made perfect and holy. And that your sins and your iniquities, he will remember no more. That's called justification. It means to be made just as though, if you can wrap your hands around it, just as though you never were a sinner. And see, that would have to be to stand in the presence of a holy God. And then chapter 12, he gave us more instructions about how we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, how to run this race now that we're in it, because we've come to faith in Christ. And as we come to chapter 11, you might want to get your pad and pen out. There are 11 pithy little exhortations that he gives to these Christians that are suffering, that are being challenged, and some are discouraged, and some are ready to throw in the towel. He gives 11 in chapter 13 of these pithy little exhortations as he closes out this letter to the Hebrews. And so let me give those to you, then we'll pray and we'll dive in. So write fast, and, and if you don't write fast, then you'll have to go back and listen to the tape, and you'll have to listen to me for the second time. So I'm gonna speak very fast, so you have to go back and no. Let brotherly love continue, number one. Entertain strangers, number two. Remember those that are suffering for their faith, number three. And remember always means to pray for them. So pray for those that are suffering for their faith. And, you know, this is the time of the year where some of you will suffer as you go to be with your family members. They're going to think you lost your mind. I remember what my parents thought when I came home. They thought I was on another trip. You know, when, you know, I got saved back in the 70s, and you know, I came out of that whole cultural thing. And so, but remember those that are suffering for their faith. Marriage is precious. He's going to talk about marriage. Be content with what you have. Pray for leaders. Beware of strange and false doctrine. Be not ashamed of Jesus Christ your Lord. Keep looking for the return of Jesus Christ for His church. Oh, I like this one. Be thankful. Be thankful. Listen, this is as bad as it gets for us Christians. Do you know that? This is as bad as it gets. It's only going to get better and better as we move toward that moment when he takes us out. Be thankful. Obey those. This is kind of self-serving. But obey those who have rule over you. Obey your pastor. <laughs> obey him as he obeys the Lord. And then pray. Those leaven pithy, powerful little exhortations as we close out this book of Hebrews. Paul just leaves these Christians with. And so let's begin with the first one. It says, let brotherly love continue. And the reason why he says that is for a number of reasons. But the first thing we think of when we hear that, and by the way, these are imperatives. You know what an imperative is? It's a commandment. This is not a suggestion. So he's not suggesting to you that you should let brotherly love continue. He's commanding us to do this. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, you know, there's a little song we sing in Sunday school that goes along this. These are the lyrics to it. Beloved, let us love one another. And every time I read this passage, I think of that little song that they sing in Sunday school. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. 
But he that loveth not knoweth not God, because God is love. He doesn't work at being loving. He is love. And so when we read this, the first thing that we think about is as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the family of God, as sons and daughters of the Most High, there is that commandment because, you know, the Spirit of the living God lives in us and the fruit of that Spirit is love. That's the fruit of it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, meekness, self-control, that we should love one another. That the person sitting next to you, you should esteem them more important than yourself, the Bible says. That we should be others-centered. And so, first and foremost, obviously, uh, we, should, we should love the body of Christ. But secondly, and I think we don't think in terms like this too often, but Galatians 6.10 says this, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Not, not just your Christian brothers and your Christian sisters. But we should have a love for humanity. You know, for the people that are broken and hurting. Um, sometime I'd like to take some of you guys and Well, I, I think they're, they've torn it down now. But I used to go up to the homeless camp across the street and just see how the, the guys up there were doing. And I got to know a few of those guys. And some of those guys are just Vietnam vets that just... And it's not that they don't have an income, that they have a retirement from the government and they have, some of them have social security, but because of what they have gone through in Vietnam, they choose to live in the woods. They, they don't trust people. And you could see it on their faces the first time I walked into their camp and what, what are you doing here? Well, I just, I know you guys are up here. I'm, I just, I'm concerned for you. And, you know, is there anything I can do to help? And so we should have a love for our fellow man um, let, as, as much as you have opportunity, let us love all men, but especially those of the household of faith. So we should do that. Because John three sixteen, and here it is in 17, we quote that all the time. You watch a football game, you'll see guys holding this particular scripture up. But I think sometimes we don't digest it properly. Listen to what it says. For God so loved the world. It doesn't say for God so loved us Christians. No, he does. But God loves this world. And his desire is that none perish. In fact, he said he didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick, the broken, the maimed, the lame. And God's heart goes out to those people. They're like the lost sheep. Jesus would say things like, listen, I'm the good shepherd. And listen, I will leave the 99 if one of my sheep is lost to go find it. And so I say, for God so loved the world. And my prayer is, especially during this time of the year, and, and all the times of the year, we should have a heart for those who don't know Jesus. We have, should have a heart for those that are broken and caught up in this world, that are drowning in their sin, like you and I used to be. We all had our manner of life in times past, amen? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. You know my story. You know what I came out of. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. You know, I was just a drug-abusing, amoral mean, spirited, hateful young man until Jesus found me. But somebody stopped and shared the gospel with me. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. We should be willing to give. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have age abiding life. And then verse 17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. Listen, the world's already condemned. You know, I knew that there was something broken and wrong about me before I was saved. The world knows that. The problem is you don't need to go tell them that they're sinners. Please do not do that. And if you think that's the message, stop it. You don't go tell people they're sinners when they already know they're sinners. Go tell them how not to be a sinner. Go tell them that God loves them, Jesus cares about them, and that He's the answer for the problems in their life. And if they would just surrender their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then He could come in and begin to fix the mess. That's the message of the gospel. Gospel means good news. It's not good news to look at somebody and wag your finger and say that you're nothing but a ranked sinner. Hey, I knew that. I already knew that. But I thank God that a man looked me in the eyes at White Eagle Gas Station in 1974. A guy that I kind of knew in high school, Dwayne Bird, and he said, Mike, Jesus loves you. I'd never heard that before. And he has something better for your life. And you need to give your life to him. And then he stopped pumping his gas, put the nozzle back in the thing, got in his car and left. It wrecked me. 
The Holy Spirit took that and cooked in me. Because I, I, I thought, if anything, God hated me, wanted nothing to do with me. But God so loved this world, he loved Mike Warren in his B.C. days that he was willing to send his son to pay the penalty for my sin and to bring me back into relationship with him by no effort of my own, he did it. And that was the best news I ever heard in my life. You know, I never experienced hope until the night I gave my life to Christ. It was like a light went on. I, I never experienced peace. You know, the only peace I ever found was in a pill and a bottle and in a bag. And I found that there's peace someplace else that is much deeper, much greater, much more satisfying than those things. And then I learned as I grew in my faith that those things were idolatry because I was looking to the wrong things to bring peace into my life because there's only one thing that could do that. And that's surrendering your life to Jesus. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And if that is the heart of our Father, and He calls that brotherly love, and He commands us that it should continue, should we not have a heart for those people that are lost? How can we just drive by somebody standing on the side of the road? Now, ladies, I would caution you, be careful with that in the times we live in. Use wisdom. But you men, if you see somebody, pull over, pick them up. Give them a ride. And then start telling them about the love of Jesus. That Jesus could come into their life and rescue them just like he did you. And share your testimony and share the gospel. Jesus left us to be the salt and the light of this world. He left us to be the ones who bring light into darkness and that bring salt. That antiseptic effect that stops the putrefaction of this world into people's lives. Freely you have received, freely give. So when, when Paul begins to give these exhortations, the first one he talks about is this brotherly love, love for humanity, love for your fellow man, love for the people in the church. And, and understanding that those who don't know Christ need to know him. And listen, you're the only gospel that they're going to hear. You're an epistle read of all men. Speak up and speak the truth and speak it in love. Because Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 tells us, listen carefully, because this is the main sign that we're living in the last days. Again, when they came to Jesus in the beginning of this chapter, and they said, you know, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? Because we know that there's a day coming when you're going to step back into human history, you're going to judge the world and set up your, your eternal kingdom. So what is that going to look like? And so he gives them a bunch of birth pangs. How many have been with your wife when she's going through labor? You know, it starts out slow, doesn't it? And it builds until they're absolutely demon, I mean, absolutely out of their mind just before they deliver. And it's all your fault, and it's okay. <laughs> Things get really bad just before delivery. Well, he tells us this is what it's going to look like just before I return. Listen carefully, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, absolute lawlessness. See any of that going on? And the love of many will wax cold. Love for fellow man. Love, not selfish, self-centered love, but actually loving other people. Caring about other people. Being willing to put other people's needs above your own. He said that will grow cold. And you see it today. I tell you, there must be a lot of carpenters in our town that never bought one of those really nice new kind of uh, table saws. You know, the ones that if you put your finger in them, it stops. It doesn't cut your finger off. Because I have a lot of people waving to me with one finger all the time in this town. <laughs> and so I, I, I wave back, Jesus, one way. Because that's the world. But we're called to let brotherly love continue. Uh, number two. Then he says this, and don't forget to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. 
So, you know, maybe sometimes when you see somebody hurting or de- uh, destitute or, or hitchhiker or whatever, you know, you run across somebody in the store that looks like they, you know, they, they could use some encouragement. You don't know that that's not a test. You don't know that God hasn't brought that person into your life for you to show the love of Christ. And it could be a test. You know, I, I've told the story before, and I was coming back from Nevada camping, and, and I had broken down, and my and the radiator hose split, and, and the radiator, the, all the water went out, and I was trying to find out if I had enough water, because I was out there camping in my little truck, and, and this person pulls up, and he said, hey, I see your problem, or you got a bad radiator? I go, yeah, I know, but, um, you know, I just passed out of that town, and they probably had a parts store, and he goes, well, I'll go get you one. Well, he didn't even look at what, uh, maybe he saw the name on the truck or whatever, but he just takes off and he comes back with a radiator hose and with antifreeze. And so I said, well, thank you. And let me put it on, make sure it fits, because if it doesn't, you can, maybe you can take it back. And so I put it on, filled it up, and I went to thank the guy and he was gone. And it was on one of those long straight roads where I could see as far as I could see down that way and see as far as I could see that way and he wasn't there. And sometimes those things just show up. And sometimes God brings you along the way to test you. Be careful that you're not too busy to entertain strangers because here he tells us sometimes you've actually entertained an angel. Uh, The third one, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being also yourself in the same body. You know, the Bible says that we are to weep for those who weep and rejoice for those who rejoice. And you can find that in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. There needs to be a sensitivity in the body of Christ, is what he's saying. Um, you know, there are people around this planet that are suffering for the cause of Jesus. In fact, the Voice of Martyrs said that in 2014, the greatest martyrdom has taken place in recorded history in North Sudan. I got the wonderful privilege of visiting South Sudan and training the chaplains there. And I have pictures of those guys that I trained up in my office. And one of them had seven bullet holes. Another one had two, Lino and uh, Elijah, because they were bringing the children out of the Nubian Mountains out of through the South Sudan to safety in North Uganda where we were teaching there at the at the base and so you know you just we pray for those people just because you're not suffering right now the way they're suffering doesn't mean we shouldn't be remembering them and praying for them in their afflictions and then look around some of you are going through very tough times and so the body of Christ you know our brothers and sisters in the faith we should be concerned about your needs In fact, again, when Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he says, you need to be others-centered, not self-centered. And you need to be more concerned about the needs of others and not just your own needs. Because Christ certainly modeled that, did he not? Was he not others-centered? And so there's an exhortation to be careful not to become self-centered, not to become self-consumed, but to look around and see the needs of others and see what others are suffering and be an encouragement and pray for them. Number four, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Now, if you don't mind marking your Bible, circle the word honorable because it's a very interesting word. Many other times in the New Testament, it's translated precious. Precious. Marriage is a precious thing. And every one of you men ought to turn and look at your wife when you wake up tomorrow morning and go, I can't believe you're still here. Ladies, can I get an amen? Because yeah. if, you, if you have a wife, the Bible says that it's a gift from God. And every gift that God gives, we don't deserve. And every gift that God gives is precious. And man, God gave you that woman. And he says you are to love her. Like Christ loved the church. 
you to give yourself for her like Christ gave himself for us. You are to be the spiritual leader. You are to wash her in the water of the word. And if there's any spot or wrinkle, and he's not talking about physically, he's talking about spiritually. If there's anything lacking in her spiritually, it's your job through the bringing in of the word and prayer. And as you become the spiritual leader of your home, you, you, you draw her closer to Christ. And so he says, listen, marriage is a precious thing. It's an honorable thing. In fact, it's the only place that sexual activity in the eyes of God is permitted. In fact, he would even say to us this morning that in the wedding bed, because two become one flesh, you know what that's saying? It says a, a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two become one. Three times that's mentioned in the Bible, and two of those times are in the context of marriage when a man and a woman comes together in a sexual way because there's something bonding about that, something intimate concerning it. And it's something that literally, you know, and that's why we just, when we went through uh, last Wednesday night's teaching, you know, we were talking about don't defraud one another. Because the husband's body doesn't belong to him, it belongs to the wife, and the wife's body doesn't belong to her, it belongs to the husband. Read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But there's something that happens very intimately, very, very spiritually, when the two come together in that way. And it's only to be in the wedding bed. It's only to be in the wedding bed. Because you lessen it and you diminish it when you take it out of that. And it's no longer precious. It's no longer special. And then he says, the whoremongers and the adulterers I will judge. And that means somebody who practices this stuff as a way of life. I can't tell you how many, because we do free premarital counseling, how many Christian couples have come from other churches here and, and when I'm trying to counsel them, they're arguing like a married couple. And all of a sudden it dawns on me that they, they've stepped over the line. They're not trying to find the will of God any longer. They're not trying to find out if they're compatible any longer. They've already stepped into something they should have never stepped into. And they're arguing like a married couple and they're acting like they need to get a divorce. And so I will look at them and I'll say... Are you guys sexually active? And they'll say things to me like, well, God knows my heart. And I said, exactly, it's desperately wicked. Have you not read that he made them man and woman? And for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and through the honorable act of marriage be connected to his wife. And what God joined together, let no man put asunder. Yeah, but you know, uh, I love her and she loves me. I said, no, you don't. You lust her. And as a spiritual leader, you're willing to enter her into sin before you're married? And then I would look at her and say, man, if you can't trust him now, you won't be able to trust him later. You might want to put an end to this thing. Because marriage is honorable. It is precious. Not to be entered into lightly. And it's the only place that is acceptable for, for sexual relationships is in marriage. Then he says, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Make no mistake about it. In fact, let me read you a verse, just so we can prove that. In First, in first Corinthians chapter 6, we'll start our reading in verse 9, and we'll read through verse 11. Paul is saying to this church, and by the way, this church, you know, Paul begins the letter to this church by saying, I want to present you as a chaste virgin unto the Lord. But they had all of these problems, very carnal church. There was a young man in that church that was having sexual relationships with his father's wife, his stepmom. And they were taking each other to court. They were getting drunk at the, at the Lord's Supper, at, at, at communion. And just a lot of carnality that Paul had to deal with. But he's going to deal with it because he wants them to come to repentance. And they do. And they do come to repentance for it so that, so that they could be acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. And so as he's writing this church, he says, Know you not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. You see, we have a deceiver that wants to come in and he wants to justify sin. There's no justification for sin. We should repent of it. And every time you fall into it, you should repent. There should be something broken about you concerning it. If the Holy Spirit is in us and we're truly born again, then sin should grieve us. 
But sin can deceive us too. And so he's writing to these Christians. He's saying, listen, you need to know something. That in righteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And the idea here is those who live a lifestyle of unrighteousness. Now, I know that every one of us in this building who are truly born again, we don't want to do that, but sometimes we stumble and sometimes we fall. Anybody do that this week? Yeah. And God's grace is sufficient. And if you confess your sin, He's just and faithful to cleanse you and to forgive you of that sin. And that's why John writes in the second chapter of 1 John, and he says, listen, my little born again ones, I write unto you that you sin not. That should always be the standard. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous, who has propitiated your sin. He, he's, he satisfied the, the, the emotions of the Father as you've grieved Him and the Holy Spirit when you sin, and He removed the penalty from sin. But still, the standard for us Christians should be, we don't want to sin. Amen? We want to walk pleasing before the Lord. And so he's saying here that, that you need to understand that those who practice as a way of life, practice um, unrighteousness. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. He says, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators. Um, That word comes from proneus. We get pornography from that. It's any sexual sin. Any sexual immorality. Fornicators, adulterers, those who put other things ahead of their relationship with the Lord is idolatry. The thing you think the most about, the thing you participate the most in, the thing you spend the most money on is your God. Idolaters or adulterers. Now, adultery is a specific sin against the Lord. If you are married and you're having sexual relationships with somebody other than your married partner, it's adultery. It's adultery. And by the way, adultery can even happen in your mind. It doesn't have to happen physically. Or effeminate and abusers of themselves from mankind. That's homosexuality. Don't let anybody tell you that the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. I've witnessed to a lot of homosexuals. I witnessed to a gal. We got caught up, and I've told you a story before, in a gay parade back in Philadelphia. We're out there helping start church, and we came out because we told the kids that went with us. We took a whole bunch of kids, and we were helping plant a church. There we were doing, you know, coffee houses in the evening, testimonies, out knocking on doors, inviting people to the church. And, and so afterwards, you told them, we'll take you down to Independence Hall, and we'll give you a tour of where the Constitution came, and then we'll take you over to Gettysburg. And so we spent a couple days after two weeks of laboring. And so as we're coming out of one of the buildings, heading to where they had the Liberty Bell, all of a sudden we're in a throng of people. And I look to my right, and there's a gal there in a purple priestly robe with a backwards collar and a rainbow flag. And and all of a sudden I I realize we're on TV. There's cameras up there. And I I looked to my other pastor friend. I said, if they they get this on the 6 o'clock news, we are in trouble. You know, so it's exit stage left. And so as, we, as I got out of the crowd, there was a couple ladies over there with the sign that says, God hates gays. And I went over to the ladies and said, you need to pack up and go home. God does not hate these people. He does not hate these people. He died for these people. He loves these people. And your message does not honor the Lord. And it certainly doesn't represent me. And I am a Christian. So you need to pack it up and take it home. And so as I'm leaving there, the lady comes running over to me. She says, I hope you gave it to them. I said, I am one of them. But they have the wrong message. She goes, you're a Christian and you don't agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. In fact, I will tell you, God loves you. And she, you, it, she looked like a duck hitting the head with a stick. She took back like, and said, you're a Christian and you believe God loves me? Absolutely he loves you. He loves you so much he thinks you're to die for. And he did. Well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, it doesn't matter if you believe the Bible or not. You can go up to the top of Independence Hall, the bell tower, and jump off and yell all the way down to the ground. You don't believe in gravity. Doesn't matter. You're still going to splat right on that pavement because there are universal laws. Well, I was born this way. I said, I agree. She goes, you're a Christian, and I'm gay, and you're telling me, you're telling me that God loves me, And you're agreeing with me that I was born this way? Absolutely. Pick your poison. We're all conceived in sin and born in transgression. Jesus came to rescue us from that. And that's what he wants to do for you. 
I said, let me ask you a question. You're saying to me what you want, and this is what this parade's about, tolerance. But that's really not what you want. Because have I not been tolerant? She goes, you've been most tolerant. I said, what you want is acceptance. And I can't give that to you. Because we're only accepted in the beloved, in Christ Jesus. And I once was outside of that. And I heard the gospel and I responded to it. And I accepted Christ as my Savior. And He took away the bitterness and the anger. You see, if my old man, I would be wanting to beat you guys up. Because I was homophobic. I would be cursing and slandering you. Now I'm just telling you, I love you and I want to see you in heaven. But you can't keep practicing this way of life. You've got to come out from among it. Be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. God will receive you. You can be a son or daughter. It's simple. But if you practice homosexuality as a way of life, hey, nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards. You, do you know that in our society today, we're not going to get done all 11 today. We'll finish up next week. Do you know in our society today that it's, it, it's, it's an epidemic? Drunkenness is an epidemic. People are getting killed on the highways, innocent people, by people that are abusing alcohol. Wives are being abused in the home because, and husbands too, I'm finding out, from alcohol. Children are being abused. Lives are being wrecked and being ruined. It is a drug. It is a drug. And it's a mind-altering, mood-altering drug. I know because I used to be an alcoholic. Now, if you would have asked me back in my BC days, hey, you know what? C can you stop drinking? I would have told you, absolutely, anytime I want. That was a lie. I just don't want and it ruined my life, along with the drugs and all the other stuff that I was involved in. The stupid stuff. Sin will make you stupid. And you'll try to justify it. And that's why he says, don't be deceived. Drunkards or brawlers, revilers, extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Hey, I qualify. I was that. Everything you see on the list, that was me before I was saved. Can I get an Amen. We all had our manner of life in times past. Hey, let's just level the playing field. Hey, there ain't a person in here that didn't used to be a sinner. And the only difference between when you were a sinner and when you're saved is you're a saved sinner. You're still making mistakes, but, you, but your heart's broken over those mistakes. But we don't practice this as a way of life any longer because we've been born again by the Spirit of God. Listen, we put off the old man, we put on the new man, and we're doing our best to walk in this newness of life. And when we fall short, we confess. If you will confess your sin, the word is homiligeo in the Greek. We agree with you, God, that you were right and I'm wrong. I'm not justifying it anymore. No, Lord, it's wrong. I confess. I need your help not to do that anymore. I confess. We're, <laughs> and such were some of you. You know, I'll, I'll take the you out and say, such was you, Mike Warren. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. You have been made holy. You have been justified, made just as though you never were a sinner in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become brand new. The things that we used to participate in and we thought brought us joy and pleasure, we don't do that anymore. We hate those things. It doesn't mean they don't trip us up from time to time, but we hate those things. Because marriage is precious. It's honorable. And he says, the wedding bed is undefiled. But those who take that sexual activity outside of the wedding bed, he calls them whoremongers. And those that take the sacred part of marriage outside of the marriage, he calls those adulterers. And he said, listen, God will judge them. So, you know, if you're caught up in that this morning and you're naming the name of Christ and you're calling yourself a Christian, stop it. Repent of it. Turn and go in the opposite direction. Repentance in the Greek is metanoia. It means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. And God will forgive you. He stands ready to forgive. But you can't continue to do that. Because marriage 
is precious. Okay, enough of that. Stepped on enough toes on that one, huh? Okay, number five. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Conversation is the manner of living. Let your manner of living be without coveting things, but be with, content with such things as you have, for I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Listen, God calls us to be content. You know, there's a lot of discontent. And even in Christians, discontent. Because you, you don't trust that what you have, God has provided. And, and we're not thankful for it. Listen, can I, can I tell you guys something this morning? You in the United States, as a blue-collar person, and most of the people in our community are blue-collar people, and most of us live right about the average income or below. But we still live 97% better than the rest of the world. You living at the top 3% of the world, there are people going to bed tonight that will be hungry, that have had one meal, or cold, persecuted under a tyrannic government. And we ought to be thankful. We ought to, in fact, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says this, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. I am so thankful. You know, it doesn't matter what goes on in my life. It doesn't matter what difficulty I have to go through. It doesn't matter what financial situation I find myself in or physical. Listen, I am thankful because I know that I am saved. And that my name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And that one of these days, either by the grave or by the rapture, Jesus is coming for me because he's preparing for me a place in my Father's house. And all things on that day will be made right. But if God strips me of something, then I'm thankful. Because the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Maybe he needs to take something from me to teach me humility or to teach me to trust, or have more faith, or pray. Listen, we need to learn not to covet things, but be thankful for what the Lord has provided. Amen? So many unthankful people. Don't be one of them. And so we need to be thankful. And then he says this, um, verse 7, this is number 6, Remember them that have rule over you, who have spoken the word of God Unto you is the idea whose faith you are following and consider the end of their life because um, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You know, there is a discontent that goes on in the body of Christ against people in ministry. It's like you, you think that you have the right to judge because you expect them to be perfect when you're not. You don't have any understanding of the warfare they go through to do what they do for you because they're servants. And so what he's saying is be careful not to criticize those people God has put over you, but be thankful for them. Be thankful that God's provided you a pastor and a shepherd, someone who cares for you, someone who will study and feed you. So remember those who minister the word of God unto you. And then number seven, verse nine, do not be carried away with diverse and strange doctrine. For it is good thing that your heart be established with grace, not with meats, not with physical things, not with carnal things is the idea for meats there, which have no profit to them that have occupied themselves therewith. Be careful that you're not led away from the grace of God. You see, if you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand it's because of His grace. That He was gracious to you. That He was gracious to me. What does that mean? It means favor against merit. When we deserved his judgment, he gave us his mercy. When we deserved to be separated from him, he sent his son to pay our penalty, to bring us back into fellowship with him. And that's a work of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It's a gift from God. And it's not of your works lest you could boast. But you are his workmanship. You are created in Christ Jesus to walk in good works. Which he foreordained, by the way, that you should be walking in them. But we have to understand that we should not be carried by by every wind of doctrine. I would suggest to you, stop reading books written by men. 
Because the best book a man writes is still written by men. There's a book that is ordained of God. God breathed, inspired in Aaron, authoritative. It comes from the very heart and mind of Almighty God through these men to put pen to paper under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to write these things to us. Spend time in the Word of God. Spend time in the Word of God. We had a doctor who was a gynecologist in town, had a practice here and worked at the hospital. And many of you ladies probably went to him before he moved to Montana. And his marriage got in trouble. And he's given me permission to share this. His marriage got in trouble. His wife worked for him. She was a nurse. And working together, things, their marriage got in trouble. They, he told me they'd spent $3,000 on counselors. They went to a different church. And that church there didn't do marriage counseling. They sent you to a psychologist. And he said, I spent $3,000 and it's gotten worse. So I don't have any expectations of you. Because when he walked in the office, he said, where's, where's, your, where's your degrees? I said, I don't know. I had some. You know, I, I have graduated from Bible college. I've gone through counseling courses. I, I am ordained. Well, what, how come the certificates are on the wall? I said, the guy you went to last time, did he have certificates on the wall? He goes, yes. And he charged you how much an hour? He told me. And he said, I spent 3000 with him. Did it get better? No. So, then why are you here? Because someone recommended you. Okay, buckle your seatbelt, buddy. And we just started going through the Word of God. Because it's sharp and it's powerful. What God expected of him and what God expected of her. Within a few sessions, he came in and says, you tricked me. I said, how do I trick you? He said, you just told me the word. And you acted like you expected me to live it. And I am convicted. Their marriage got so good when they moved to Montana. He said, anytime you want to go hunting in Montana, you got a place to go. Gave me a Thomas Kincaid original painting. I said, I can't accept anything. He said, listen, dude, I spent a lot more on this with other counselors and it never got better because the Word of God will cut men and women's hearts. It will convict them of sin if you allow it. And so he's saying, listen, don't be led away with strange stuff. And there's a lot of strange stuff out there. And then he says this, because we have an altar whereof they have no right, that is the world, to eat thereof that serve the tabernacle. We can come boldly into the very throne room of God to receive help and mercy in a time of need. For the bodies of those beasts, he's talking about religion, and the blood sacrifices they bring to the sanctuary, and the high priest, they offer them as a burnt offering, and then they take the carcass outside of the camp and burn it. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered with outside of the camp. And then they crucified him outside of the camp. And so number eight, he says this in verse 13, Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Don't be ashamed of Jesus Christ is what he's saying. Don't be ashamed of your Lord Jesus Christ. Because he suffered and was crucified. And by the way, crucifixion was reserved for the worst criminal. He was treated like he was a sinner. He was crucified, which is the worst and most humiliating death that the Roman Empire could have perfected in that day. And they took him outside of the city, outside of the camp to do it, saying that he's being rejected of men. And listen, you're going to be rejected of men as well if you believe and follow and live for Jesus Christ. And so don't be ashamed of Him. Don't be ashamed of Him. In fact, He says, if you're ashamed of me now before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the, and the holy angels. Don't be ashamed of Him. I'm not ashamed of Him. I was a drug-abusing, amoral hippie. He rescued me. My parents were ashamed of me. I was ashamed of me. People were ashamed of me. I broke every relationship you could break because I was just mean-spirited. But Jesus was not ashamed of me. He tracked me down until he found me. And he loved me when I didn't even like myself. And the Bible says he's not ashamed to be called my God. He's not ashamed of me. So why should I be ashamed of him? I'm not going to be. I'm going to tell you straight up, serve him. He's the only thing worth serving in this life. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, number nine. For, he, for, he, for here have we no continuing city. We don't have a permanent city here, but we seek one. We seek one that is to come. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually, which is the first fruits of our lips giving thanks unto him. Listen, don't settle down. This is not your home. We're just passing through. How many believe Jesus is coming back for you? Jesus said in John chapter 14, he said, listen, I'm going away. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. Because in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. But I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And when it's done, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself that where I am, you might be also. That's a promise. We're just waiting for that moment. We're just enduring this life. We're, we're sojourners. We're pilgrims. We're not vagabonds. A vagabond is someone who has no home. Listen, a pilgrim is somebody that's away from home, and a soldier, a soldier is somebody that's away from home, and a pilgrim is somebody that's headed home. I'm headed home. I'm going to touch this world just as lightly as possible. Because the present scheme of things is rapidly passing away. This isn't your home. You're in preparation for that which is to come. You're in preparation for that which is to come. That's why Jesus said, listen, watch, be ready, be prepared. You know not the day or the hour the Son of Man comes, but He will come in a time that's unexpected when you're not looking for it. But we as true believers of Jesus Christ, we've not settled down here. The Bible says, love not the world nor the things that are in the world because of the love of the world be in you. The love of the Father cannot. All that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, sexual immorality, the lust of the eye, materialism, and the pride of life, thinking you're wiser than God is of the world and the world is passing away. But he that doth or she that does the will of the Father will abide forever. In fact, Paul would tell us that the sufferings of this pleasant life, whatever we got to put up with or get rid of to make it to heaven, won't even be worthy to be compared to what lies on the other side. So, you know, they should have that commercial, pay me now or pay me later. I would rather suffer now and rule and reign with him later than have all the things of the world now and be rejected by him later. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. I found it to be the most blessed life. 48 years a Christian. Ex-hippie. Saved sinner. Just another beggar showing another beggar where the bread's at. But listen, we seek a city that's yet to come. And then in verse 17, obey them. This is self-seeking, I know. Well, self-serving. Um, obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves unto them for they watch for your souls as those who must give an account that they may do it with joy. You know, how, how many have children? How many have the nice compliant one? None of you guys have a compliant child? You know, the Bible says you reap what you sowed. I, my, all my kids should have been just, I mean, I, I wore my mom out. Chasing rattlesnakes and climbing trees. I'm telling you, she, she had a whole list of those things when I got older that told me, tell me that the gray hair in her head, I put it there. Listen, you, none of you have compliant kids? Okay, how many of you have kids that aren't compliant? That if you say up, they say down. You say left, they say right. You say white, they say black. Anybody have any of those kind of kids? Don't be one. <laughs> Don't be a child of God. Don't be a son and daughter of Almighty God. And be like that to your father. Listen, I'm just the messenger. I didn't write this book. And I'm not responsible for how you act when you read it. I'm just a mailman. I'm here to deliver it to you. But don't crucify the messenger because you don't like the message. That's what he's saying here. So obey those because they're here under God's instruction to give you God's word. Like even today, some of the things we've talked about are hard, aren't they? Surrender, crucifixion, dying to self, not living for the world. Uh, And some of you are probably in your mind saying, when I leave here, I'm not coming back. That guy's a loon. No, no, you're not going to come back because you were cut and you were convicted. And you're either willing to say, Lord Jesus, I've heard what you had to say and I'm sorry. Your word is right. Even though you had to use that knucklehead to deliver it, it was right. And I want to listen. I want to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Word of God, and I want to be obedient. So obey them that have rule over you. God put us in this position. I didn't. I'd like to put myself out of this position, but He won't. Obey them that have rule over you. Submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account. 
and do it in such a way that it may be joyful for them is the idea, not grievous, for that would be unprofitable for you. You know, we read in James Gospel, um, chapter, uh, James Gospel, James Epistle, in chapter 3, verse 1, my brethren, be not many masters, be not many spiritual leaders, knowing that you shall receive the greater judgment. God's going to hold me to a higher judgment than he holds you to because it was my responsibility to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. What you do with that, you will be held accountable for. My job as a messenger of the Lord is to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the whole truth is that God loves you. And the whole truth is God has called you out of this world. You are the called out ones to serve Him. He translated you from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, but not freedom to live in sin, freedom to serve Him who called you out of that darkness. And listen, because He is the Lord, He has the right to tell us how to live. He has the right to command us to do those things, to instruct us to do those things. And our responsibility as Christians is to be obedient to Him and to that work of the Spirit, that convicting work of the Spirit that leads and guides us into all truth, to be obedient to His Word. And in those moments when we come up short and we fall and we fail, like we all do, then we repent. We acknowledge that, God, You were right and I was wrong. I make no excuse for it. There's no justification in it. What I did, I should not have done. I'm asking You to forgive me and help me not to continue to do that anymore. That's the heart of the true believer that's the life of the born again one that's the one who walks in the spirit and it doesn't mean you don't fall down but you get up you keep moving forward you're forgetting those things are behind you press for the upper calling amen so he's telling us here listen obey those and then one more pray i'll tie knot in this in a moment pray in fact paul said pray for us listen how many and i'm going to hold you to it so i'm going to be watching who raises their hands how many of you would commit at least once a day to pray for me? Because I need your prayers. I'm just a man that's called to do an impossible job in the flesh. Because I'm not a cheerleader. I'm just a messenger. And the things I'm teaching you, I struggle with too. I have to rely on the Holy Spirit to help me to be obedient. So I just need you to pray for me. It's my job to go in before the Lord, receive from Him what He wants to say to you, and to come and deliver it to you. And sometimes, because you don't like, I'm not saying all of you, we have like thousands and thousands of people to tune into this church around the United States and around the world. And you can't, in, on the radio, we're in the Sacramento area, the Reno area, or in our local area, and you can't believe the people that call me up that want to challenge me because they don't like what they hear. And I've had to tell them over and over, take it up with the Lord. He wrote it. I'm just delivering it. Do you know if a bill's coming to your mailbox, do you wait as a sniper for that mailman to show up so you can shoot him so you don't get the bill? <laughs> I feel like sometimes I'm being sniped. I've learned how to dog and weave, man. Listen, I'm just the mailman. But you know what? Sometimes the mailman brings blessing. If you open up the mailbox and pull it out. Amen. And so, he ends with this exhortation in verse 19 after he says, pray for us. But I beseech you rather to do this, that I may be restored unto you sooner. That's why we believe Paul wrote this, is Paul is saying, pray for us, but also pray that I could come and visit you. Now the peace, now the God of peace that brought you again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in, in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then you think he's done, but he's not, just like me. 
You think just because he said amen, he's done. He ain't done. He's got three more verses to say. Then he says, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. Listen to it. Let it cut you. Let it correct you. The three men that spoke most of my life corrected me. He said, I beseech you, brethren, suffer it. Let it do its work. The word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Paul said few words, 13 chapters. I took us like three months to get through it. Few words. So don't ever think I teach long. Few words. He probably had a lot more to say, but he just cut it short. Reader's Digest, Digest Version. Some of you don't even know what the Reader's Digest Version is. How many knows what the Reader's Digest Version is? Oh, you guys do. You know, when I used to do book reports, I'd find, I'd find a, a book that had, the title kind of went along with one of the Reader's Digest, because we used to subscribe to Reader's Digest, and I'd do my book report, and the teacher caught on to me. She goes, hey, that was a really good story from the Reader's Digest. <laughs> Give you an A for creativity. Always looking for the shortcut before I say, I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of God, that exhortation, that warning, for I've written unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy, and again, that's why we know this is Paul, is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. Salute all those that have rule over you and all the saints that are of Italy. Salute you. Uh, Tracy, we salute you. You're from Italy. Our worship leader. Grace, grace, grace. You know, Alan Redpath at the end of his life said if I had to do it all over again, one of my favorite authors and preachers and teachers, he said if I had to do it all over again, I'd preach more grace. In fact, Whitfield, the great revivalist at the end of the last century and the beginning of this one, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, great evangelist was part of the great awakening thousands upon thousands got saved and he said you know the people that got saved under grace the percentage of them that stayed with the faith was much greater than the people that got saved under the law because the law can only condemn listen are you saved by grace has God been gracious to you has he forgiven you a debt that you could never repay and do you understand this morning as Paul closes out this epistle that by Christ's sacrifice and his sacrifice alone you have been made perfect and holy. And through that sacrifice he has forgiven you of all your sins. In fact, so forgiven you of your sins that he won't even remember them anymore. And then he, then he says, you are justified, made just as though you never were a sinner. That's grace. And that grace teaches us to live right before the Lord because we want to love Him back the way He has loved us. And so He would say, Grace be with you all. Verily so be it. That's what amen means. What a wonderful book. And we did get to the end today. I just, again, another Christmas season coming. The birth of our Messiah, our Savior. And I want to thank you. This will be the 48th time that I get to do that. Since you pulled me out of the misery that I was in. And put your life in me, Lord. Thank you. I'm never going to forget it, Lord. You are worthy. You're the only worthy, Lord. And Lord, you're the only one that deserves because you are the glorious one. You do glorious things. And so, Lord, we just thank you. Be with each person here, Lord, as they leave this place, Lord. And, you know, whatever they got to face tomorrow or later today, Father, may they experience your peace. Give them wisdom. Guard them and keep them, Lord, from the wicked one. Pour your blessing out upon them, Lord. May they sense your presence. And, Lord, may they be a light and a witness to their family members that don't know you. May they share, not the judgment of God, but the love of God. Because it's the love of God that leads to repentance. So help us, Lord Jesus, we pray. 
to be light and salt in this season. You know, we should be the seasoning for the season. And help us to do that. I just thought of that. That's pretty good. I'll have to remember that. Season for the seasoning in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen. amen.